Hi there, everybody. Welcome back to part four of this week's episode of Leading Our Own Way. We're getting into some valuable insights from this week's guests that you can definitely apply to your own journey. Please definitely stay tuned for advice and inspiration that can help us all. If you missed the first part of the week in part one, two, and three, definitely go back. The show notes should be filled with all the links, so go and click on them if you need to catch up. Also, definitely subscribe to the channel and all the other ones if you can. It's going to really help the show. But for now, enjoy the rest of the story. Before we go into that, what what made you feel... What what actions made you feel that way? You know, I think when you're in a certain kind of relationship, uh, there's a lot of implied loss of agency. And then there are more rarely distinct statements where you understand uh, yeah. one, your place and two, what you are allowed and not allowed to do. Um, and in my reality, it, it was, it was a combination of both. There was a lot of implied and my life was really set up in such a way where I did not have privacy, um, of my, you know, everything from my social media and my email to even my, my home. There were other people living in my home, um, that were, you know, monitoring me. Uh, and that sounds really paranoid, but no, these were real human beings. <laughs> yeah, no. Can you give us? Um, so. Can you give us some examples of of how you were being monitored? Um, yeah, I was being reported on my daily activities uh, to my my partner at the time from from his family members. So because they they lived in my home, um, so you know, and I was sleeping alone, um, and, and taking care of my kids. But then I'd, you know, wake up and someone would be standing over me. So even really at night when I was sleeping, I couldn't feel that I could be alone and have that space respected and honored. So, um, hold on. so hold on. yeah, hold on, hold on, hold on. Somebody stood at the end of your bed when you were asleep. Yeah, repeatedly, repeatedly. I mean, how close do they need to monitor you? You know, just the fact that you're in your room, the the door shut should be enough, right? Yeah. Well, well, yeah. Okay, so you woke up, you wake up on these occasions. What does that conversation look like in the moment? You know, I think um, when you wake up in that situation, you're really flooded with you know, adrenaline, you're flooded with a neurochemical flight or fight or flight response. Um, yeah. and you know, that's something that doesn't go away even when that person, that figure in your life is no longer having access to you. Right. I mean, there are still times when I'll wake up and because there's a different, you know, shadow in the room or, or breeze or yeah. something, something will have, you know, kind of triggered that feeling of, Oh, am I alone? Um, so, you know, unfortunately that, that feeling can can remain even when you've made choices to try and and become safer. But the good thing is then you can work on calming your nervous system and saying, no, I am alone. And you know, you can bring yourself back into your body. You can say, okay, I'm in my home. The door is locked. The alarm is on. You know, you can reassure yourself, I'm in my city. My city is safe. You can just kind of zoom in and zoom out to try and help you cope with that. But in the moment, you know, you're, you're in fight or flight. And I think again, when you're in kind of that victim mode and you're trying to over explain to the person that's making you not feel comfortable when you're trying to get them to understand their behavior, they, they know their behavior, right? So when you are trying to convince someone to stop doing something that bothers you because it bothers you, and you've said once that it bothers you, or it's an obvious thing that could bother anyone, you're already expending your energy in a direction that probably is not going to be helpful for you. If you need to say it once, okay, but you do need to understand. And there are some amazing psychologists that talk about this. Les Carter is um, a psychologist who, and a retired therapist who has an amazing podcast about dealing with controlling people. You know, He really helped me a lot on my journey of understanding that when you are bidding for that connection with someone and begging them to give you that respect, mm -hmm. that's not where you need to put your energy. You need to be focusing inward on, okay, how do I feel when someone, when I wake up and someone's standing over me? 
is that okay with me? No. What am I going to do about that? That's that's really where the energy needs to be directed. How did you stop that then? How did you get that stopped in your life? I mean, was it just leaving yeah. or did it stop yeah. before? No, the no. I think, you know, again, when you – when certain things are happening and they're making you feel – uncomfortable or unsafe, you can't continue on in that relationship or in that circumstance if it's at work where you feel unsafe, right? You can't just keep plodding on uh, in no. the same track and expect a different outcome. That's that's the definition of insanity is doing the same thing and expecting a different outcome. Um, yeah, been there. You, you have to mm. do a different Thing. You have to change your behavior if you want a different outcome. And so for me, that was, you know, no longer being in that relationship. But that's that's easier said than done. It takes a long is, yeah. time. And, you know, even relationships that have similar dynamics that have only been going on for weeks or months can be really hard to exit from, not only emotionally, but just logistically. And so, you know, I was in that relationship for many, many, many years, but I think it's important for people to understand if you just got into a relationship and things like this are happening to you or smaller things, but you're just feeling in your gut and your, your nervous system's telling you you're not comfortable, you don't feel safe, don't feel badly if exiting feels really hard because mm. one, they may be making you feel that way, but two, it's just the way we form relationships. We really mm. cherish relationships. We value relationships and even new ones are hard for us to sever ties from. It feels like losing a bit of ourself, but that comes back to you really need to invest in understanding and cherishing and valuing yourself and saying, can I move on in this relationship and this job and this whatever and be respectful to myself and value myself. And if the answer is no, then what am I going to do? What do I want to do? Yeah. So you, you, you had your two children in that environment as well, didn't you? You, you were at home. Did you, did you go, did you leave? Cause I know how hard it is to have children and work. Well, I don't know how hard it is to have two children and work in the medical industry, but mm -hmm. did you take time off from the medical industry? Yeah. At, at that point in time, I had been unable to be working uh, clinically with patients. I was only working for this individual for years. Yeah. Um, mm. So I did not have an income outside of this person's control. Um, so when you say working for this individual, mm -hmm. what do you mean by that? Uh, working for my partner. Yeah. As in pay transactions? Um, a volunteer? Well, again, as I said before, my I never actually got a paycheck. Money just went into a retirement account, but it was a retirement account that I didn't have access to. It was in I my name, but I didn't have any that was my passwords mark. or anything. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that I, I, that that came over my mind when you said it earlier. And I, mm -hmm. Um. Okay. That's interesting. I've never heard anyone talk about it like that before. Um. It, you you phrase why why do you phrase it as in working for your partner and not I suppose I don't know. You know, living at home, looking after the children. Yeah. Oh no, because I was working for an external entity. I wasn't. I was not being paid for home services. I was working for the company. Yeah. So for his company. Yes. Yeah. Right. So what was you, what were you doing as part of that role then? Sorry. No, it's okay. I I was doing a lot of things. I was doing things like HR and promotion. Right. Yeah, I got it wrong lot. totally. Yeah, I was doing a lot of roles for, for the company. Um, and I was really making less than minimum wage, but it was even just going into this retirement account. So there were lots of problems. Yeah. And, you know, taking a step back and just looking, comparing that to where I was just a few years before when I was working and seeing patients, um, yeah. the amount of power I had over my circumstances was vastly different. Um, and you know, that shift really took away a lot of my ability, um, to protect myself. But I really believed this idea of 
you know, well, if it's for the family, if it's for the family unit, if this is where my efforts will better help our family, then that's what I need to do. That's what I have to do. And so again, a lot of the decisions were, you know, should, you should do this and, and kind of moving me away from having, um, personal agency to being really dependent on this system that at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. if I were to want to not be a part of the system anymore, I'm really without control over, you know, my finances, over my career. And that's, Mm -hmm. that's really problematic. And I think, especially as a woman, um, to really be cautious if you are feeling yourself, if you have a choice and if you are kind of at the, the top of a situation like that, you know, just, just approach it with some realism and, and deep thought as to whether or not that works for you, not only in today's moment, but in the future. Is this where I want to be? Is this the position of power I want to be in if something happens in one year and five years? And just be mindful of, of consequences of those, those decisions. Were you missing the interactions of being with your patients? Oh, very much. Yeah. It's, I mean, it's so healing and um, I just adored my patients. You know, something that had happened right before um, I had taken leave from work that I think cascaded events too is I'd, I'd had my youngest child and I almost hemorrhaged to death having him. Um, so I had to take unexpected leave after that. Um, and it took me quite a while to recover from that. But then because I was home and there was this new dynamic of me showing up in that way and being available to do all of those things, it was really hard to change the tide after those expectations were set. And when I would try to rejoin the workforce, the workforce clinically, I was met with, you know, a degree of resistance um, that I felt like I couldn't overcome. But again, that goes back to this addressing these feelings of worth and of agency and ourselves and understanding that if someone's making you feel you don't have a choice, mm. that's that's wrong. You do have a choice. Is it going to be difficult? Yes. But mm-hmm. you have to choose your difficult, right? What's more difficult? And just being really honest about what does life look like now and in the future if I continue on as I am, is that acceptable to me? And what do I want to do next? Speak, speaking of choice, do I remember you in our chat that we had uh, a few weeks ago, there were other things that you were put in difficult situations um, or in, it, just in the comfort of your own home, there were certain things that you weren't allowed to do. There's certain things that you had to do. I remember the, the around the dinner table. Mm. Can you remember that? What? What? Yeah. What happened? Um, so, can we share that? Are we allowed not, to share? That? Yeah, it wasn't unusual that you know if other people were present that I I was not allowed to, you know, speak my mother tongue. Um, and I live in the States, so that's the, you know, obviously our official language. Um, I really wasn't supposed to speak that because I might make other people feel uncomfortable if I, if I spoke English. Um, so, you know, even my ability to express myself in my, in my native language was, was limited when I was home. And again, as time went on, I was really only home. Um, you know, I'd be encouraged to occasionally encouraged to see friends, but then if I did actually see a friend, you know, for the first time in months, because, uh, at some point people did start reaching out to me, a few people and saying, what's going on? You know, you used to yeah. arrange our ladies nights and now you don't even respond what's going on. Yeah. Um, mm. and if I did actually follow through and see these people, I'd be met with, well, what did you talk about? What did you do? Well, you know, that's that person's not very smart. So if they're giving you advice, you really shouldn't listen to them. Um, and, you know, do you understand the choices they make in their lives? Or would you want to take advice from someone who makes those choices? So it was, it was a very, you know, you, you'd be kind of allowed occasionally to do certain things, but then you'd be informed afterward, you know, to, you'd have to explain what happened and also be told, you know, just make sure you're not taking advice from this person. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So how I'm, um... We, we obviously know that you left that scenario. Mm. Um, I remember you using the words 
that it was a very dark and frightening time. What yeah. made it dark? If, if you're going to put it, in, if you're just going to sum this relationship up, and before we move, before you explain how you got out of it, what made it dark and frightening? Yeah. So you know, it was really frightening because you know when you're told that you'll be cut off from your finances, when you're told yeah. you'll lose your children, when you're told you'll lose your home, <laughs> that you know you'll need to move far away and you'll need to you know retrain because you you can't work because you haven't worked as a doctor for a certain period of time. You need to be credentialed. You need to retrain. All these things, right? Yeah. So when you are faced with a combination of truths and lies about what your future looks like, um, that, that weighs on you, right? And, and you feel quite caged. But again, it comes back to having support, you know, having a therapist, having a lawyer, having friends or family who can really show up the way you need them to. Um, when you have those things, for me, I liken it to, okay, you're, you're being – you're being put in a position where you're, they want you to feel like you're in a cage, but the reality is you're on a hamster wheel and you yeah. can decide to step off of it if you so choose. It's not going to be easy. You know, you've got forward momentum. You can just keep going, but for how long, right? You yeah. can't keep going forever. So you can decide to step off. So, you know, fortunately I had enough of that support that I could make that decision, but even having support it's really, really, really hard. And when you don't have access to your finances and you're really concerned about, you know, your children's welfare, when you're in that time between, you know, what life was like before and the plan, you know, per your local court system, what life looks like schedule-wise with kids and such, you know, you're in a really tenuous time where you don't really know what the outcome will be and you're just trying to keep things the status quo, keep everybody safe, keep the emotional uh, environment as good for little ones who are also on this journey with you as possible. And so that was a big part of my focus, um, but also really trying to reclaim my privacy because I really um, didn't have privacy then and, and for quite some time after, but I had to work, you know, really hard to reclaim that privacy. And I don't want to really go into the the details of that. Yeah. Um, but I worked really hard to reclaim my privacy and my my personhood. Um, and I will say a big part of that, you know, that was real and that was something I was coping with. But while you're coping with the real things and you're just constantly having to respond to the real things, there are also some things that are lobbed at you that are not real, you know, threats and, and statements yeah. that aren't real and they distract you and take away your energy and you get scared because there are these maybe very real things and you don't know how to distinguish the two and you just have to go through that messy time, through that messy middle. You have to experience it. You have to learn what's real, what's not. You have to learn how to regulate your nervous system so that you're not having this fight or flight neurochemical response to every message, to every phone call, to every email, whatever it is, however it is you're having to react to um, someone or something in your life that's making you feel like you're in a state of dysregulation. Once you learn how to cope with that, which it just takes time, you can't skip it. You've got to go through it and learn from it. Once you get there, then you can really harness your energy and focus it on healing because you are going to learn what do I need to react to? What do I need to respond to? And what do I not need to? What do I not need to worry about? And once you move past that place and you stop living from a place of fear and you really take back control over your own emotions and your responses to these external stimuli, that's when you really step into your power. And so that is a process that I had to go through um, myself that is, you know, very complex and it really takes years <laughs> to go through. Um, but yeah. I had to go through to get to the place where I am today. Um, and to also sit next to people who are on that journey too, because I'm not here when I'm life coaching to tell someone what to do. I'm here to help them to find, to come back to themselves, decide what they want to do, to set actionable 
plans to achieve those goals, to stay accountable to themselves, which is maybe something they've never done because they've only been accountable to others. Mm -hmm. And to do that, they had to sacrifice themselves and to help them move towards those goals. And so becoming a life coach is really reaffirming the process that you, that I and, and others have to go through when you're learning how to reset your mindset to really stay focused and to come back to what matters and come back to harnessing your energy and moving towards your goals. Because if you have a bunch of distractors in your life and all they're trying to do is pull you off your path, you need to give them less space in your life. They, they cannot be pulling your energy. If there's a tornado yeah. next to you. You don't have to jump inside of it, right? You may have yeah. to make yeah. some precautionary me measures, take some precautionary measures to stay safe from the tornado, but you don't have to jump into it just because it says, I'm here, I'm a tornado. And so learning how to coexist with chaos in your life is a really big, excuse me, is a really big part of taking back your, your power. I'm writing that down. I'm not being rude. I'm just writing on my pad about the no. tornado analogy. I love that. That is absolutely fantastic. Do you do you think your training, knowledge, medical background has helped you uh, understanding of the hormones, understanding of the neurotransmitters, everything that goes on internally? I feel like it might be a silly question. I don't know, but I feel like now I've studied and studying all of that side of things. I feel like I can, I can feel like I was, I was walking my dog earlier, for example, and I, in the background on my phone, no, don't normally listen to anything when I'm walking. Well, sometimes I do a mm -hmm. podcast. Sometimes I just walk, like to walk in silence so I can be present with my dog and, be out with the trees and all that nature stuff, but I love it. I'm not going to lie. I never used to be like that, but I love it. And um, I was listening to a pod, um, a, a show about a boy on America's Got Talent. And Simon Cowell said something nice about, about this kid was amazing. And I f honestly felt a surge of what I think's the serotonin. Mm. And I could feel it. Now I'm not saying I never always not felt it. I think I always felt that. I've always loved hearing judges say nice things to the contestants when I watch those, you know, silly shows, but they're fun sometimes to watch. And I always felt it, but I didn't know what it was. I just accepted right. it was part of my body, right? And just right. go with it. You don't question it. It just happens. And I think most of us do that on a daily basis when, when things like that happen. Do you, th but I felt it and I was like, mm -mm, that's the serotonin flooding from behind my <laughs> adrenal glands, right? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. do you, yeah do you do you think your medical background training knowledge and whatnot has that has prepared you better for when how you took yourself out of this situation mm. i i think so and i think once you again step away from the distractions mm. and you bring it back to your body which is really what you're talking about you know um being yeah. really present in that moment and saying like oh i feel this in my body oh i think i know what that is and i think i know why it happened and when you create those connections those data points then you can harness that power right mm. and we can do that for negative habits as well so if we are always on our phone you know like every time you pick up your phone you're like oh little dopamine hit um mm. and so if you find yourself literally just checking your email every 5 minutes getting back into your body and saying, okay, how does my body feel after I did that? Okay. What's yeah, the exactly, need yeah. that I'm meeting? What is the need that I'm meeting right now? Why am I going for that dopamine hit? Or why am I internet shopping right now? Like what is it, what's the need that I'm trying to seek by watching Netflix every night? And mm. can I harness that and get it another way? Is there another way that I can connect with someone that will give me that same reward, but will not only reward me in that moment, but moving forward in my life? And so I think, yes, understanding the neurobiology, the chemistry, understanding the pathways, how they interact with our habits and how our, our habits interact with them and how we can be a bit pragmatic about it because if we only focus on emotions for some people, that's not the language that they work in, right? So mm -hmm. 
And that's why, you know, some people will not like a podcast where they're just talking about emotions because they don't connect with that. Maybe they haven't even formed a relationship with their emotions yet. They haven't learned that their emotions are needs. They think that their emotions are, you know, a disadvantage or a problem, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So being able to connect on that neurochemical language level can be helpful to just spread the message more. But I will say I also don't like to be too technical in how I discuss things because, again, connection is really important to me. Yeah. I want to bring yeah. it into your body, but I mm. don't want you to feel disconnected from someone who's speaking science. I want to really speak to your soul instead. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's fair. Absolutely. Yeah, totally. No, I get that. Um, do you, I do have a question. I'll come back to that one, but the, um, back to you briefly before we, you know, um, I feel like there's a few different things we can touch on, um, but with you coming out of that, how did you, mm. how did you acknowledge your body and mind when you, when you took yourself out of that situation then? How did, I bet you, did you yeah. sense that? I'm guessing you sensed that big, huge of relief, didn't you? How was your months coming out of that? You know, it really took months and months and months to harness the power of my nervous system mm. um, and to shift my response to things. So I'll give an example. When you receive a message and it's really threatening, right? Um because you've been quite trained usually to respond to that threat the way that they want you to, right? Like if someone makes a threat, it's because they want a response from you. It's not because the threat is real or because really what you did was bad or wrong or true, anything. It's that they're making a stimulus because they want a certain response, right? And so sometimes to break the mold of that response, so you respond with fear and you dutifully do what is uh, demanded of you. So if you want to change that response, sometimes you have to really, really uh, throw a wrench in it. And I actually worked with my therapist on this because I was really struggling. How do I stop my nervous system from going into fight or flight mode when I even just hear the ding of the bell of a notification? And, yeah. you know, it was working a little bit. Maybe I was able to wait a little bit to open it, but I really wanted to open it because I wanted it to be done right? I just wanted it to be done. But then yeah. that'll be followed by another notification over and over again. So that wasn't really getting down to the problem, which was, are the messages triggering? Yes. But the problem isn't really even the messages. It's my response to the messages because life's going to keep on giving us challenges. It is. Yeah. So yeah. we need to focus on how we respond. And so for me, when I was in that highly emotional, highly triggered place, what I did, which is quite silly, but it was effective was when I would get a message because they were really genuinely laughable. The threats were genuinely ludicrous and not yeah. factual, right? Yeah. I decided they're funny, right? And I keep on thinking in my mind, oh, I can't believe this is happening. I can't believe this is being said. It's so not true. It's so laughable. It's like, I'm going to laugh. Instead of getting upset, I'm going to laugh out loud guffaw when I read these messages. And trick what? my nervous system. Yeah. Because you can <laughs> trick your brain, can't you? you yeah, can you can. Brain. Yeah, you can. Because the brain likes gonna... to trick you. Exactly. It wants you to go down that water slide, that path that you've had, right? And the momentum's all there. And I had to really just kind of like do a really hard roadblock to that response and a mm. new reaction, a novel reaction to trick the nervous system, as you said. And so what I would do is I would just give this big, hearty guffaw laugh. And man, it was pretty effective to just prevent myself from going into that fight or flight. And now eventually I didn't have to do that anymore. And it was really quite quick starting that new habit, you know, over, I think it was probably a few weeks that I did that. And I just consistently was like, no, this is not scary. It is laughable. It is truly ridiculous. And instead of being mad and scared and responding the way it's designed to make me respond. I'm going to respond the way that's in alignment with my understanding of these messages, which is that they're just laughable. Join us tomorrow to hear more from today's incredible guests and learn valuable insights to help you lead your own way. Don't forget to subscribe. We'll see you then.